by the time they get to me or any of the juvenile judges, this is a totally different situation. Most of the kids are, some of them are misdemeanor, you know, misdemeanor charge, but for the majority of them, they're coming into the court and they have these very intense felony offenses. I always believe philosophically, like every judge, similar to every DA or whoever works in this system, they have a philosophy. And you know, whether or not you know their philosophy or not, they have it and they will implement it in how they make their decisions. My philosophy is generally framed around this idea that it's far easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. I think a lot of us who worked in this system, me as a prosecutor or as me as working in restorative justice at MUM all those years, I recognize that trying to fix people was a lot more difficult than trying to figure out what it is that they need in order to assist them to reduce some of the trauma that we have. And like I, I've given this presentation many times to really express the idea that if you're really working in this system holistically, like I've been in Sand Ridge, uh, I've worked in prisons, I've worked outside of prisons, I've worked with law enforcement, obviously as a prosecutor, and they all sound the same. If you start listening to the people, they all been abused, neglected, they've been through multiple systems, through multiple years, and now they are in the adult system and the consequences of their actions now are have increased because now statutorily they are at a place where they can be treated as adults. This is this guides my philosophy in juvenile that we have submitted to the harsh instinct to crush those among us whose brokenness is most visible. I firmly I, I see that every day in our and how our system grinds the, the 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 young people that we are starting to really see have the most trauma needs, and rather than kind of fixing those trauma needs, and I think Andre Andre is trying to do a good job trying to kind of recycle his team and reorganize and reprioritize. But he would even he would even acquiesce to the idea that sometimes we have people in this system that don't view uh, the brokenness of these kids as something to fix. They, they really do see it as a vulnerability that they punish even more. So a lot. So so rather than, you know, me talking a lot about the school to prison pipeline as a as a juvenile judge, we are not only responsible for kids who come in who, you know, 10 to 16, who, you know, who create juvenile offenses. We are also responsible for chips. So children in need of protection and services, those families also come through our court. And what I started to recognize is in the high needs kids who were coming to my court that they had actually been in the system before. Many of them had overlapping CHIPS cases at the same time that they were having juvenile cases. So, um, so this is what I always pay attention to. I got so many laypersons, a quick distinction for them for CHIPS and GIPS. That's what, that's what I'm about to tell you. Yeah, and so the, so the child welfare system is the child welfare system that his counterpart has the other part of. You know, Andre has the JJ side, has a whole nother system, what we call child welfare. These are children who've been removed from their homes, children who've experienced some kind of trauma, the parents are not there. We're seeing an uptick of this with the opiate crisis that a lot of these families cannot take care of these children. And when you see it, you start to recognize that like they have been, they have ex experienced uh, whole levels of trauma by the time these kids are two, three, four, five, six, seven years old. We talk about you find the two year olds with dead parents. I'm, it is, it is, I mean, it's crazy, right, Chief? And so, so by the time they come to us, they're coming to us because now they're in a foster home or maybe a relative placement. But we're trying to figure out what are the services that these children need in order to assist them in being able to process this trauma. We don't have enough services. We don't have all the adequate services that we need. And what, we, what I started to see was the overlap between the child welfare system and juvenile justice system. Sometimes I will be servicing a child in a juvenile justice system that still had an open chips case at the same time. And in some cases, I thought that they shouldn't have even had a juvenile justice case. They should just have a chips case because the parents had totally ignored. Nobody showed up. There was nobody in court. There was nobody. I mean, the kids are literally living by themselves. And if they're living by themselves with nobody being responsible for them, to me, I'm like, we need to file a chips case so that they could get some services to assist this child with, you know, with, when they get ready to age out of the, the system altogether. And lo and behold, any, I don't know if anybody should be surprised that if they spent a number of years in this system and a number of years in this system, that at the age of 16, they start picking up all these cases. The one case I talk about the most is my, the young man. He, from age five to about 15, he had been moved 39 times. Five, 39 times, and he had been, he was sexually abused in the places we put him. And I had to write a decision for him because I wanted to make sure he had a written decision from a judge to follow him throughout his life. Because when I started to really listen and look at his whole file, his whole cases, and he was one of the, you know, he was one of the rampant ones doing this, I started to realize we failed him a long time ago. 
We created this placement in his life where he didn't have the resources that he needed to get hold. And we tried to put it in place, but by that time it was too late. He, we sent him Lincoln Hills and all these other places and they had gotten further abused in these places. So when people say, well, what do you do with them? What do you, where do you put them? I'm asking, I'm asking the community the same question. No, you, I'm asking you, where do I put them? Where do I use them? Because I know if I send them to Lincoln Hills, I know they're gonna get abused. I already know that. We know that. So we gotta figure out something different other place. Cause by the time these kids now 16 years old catching up adult offenses, they are already, that the pipeline has already done what it's going to do. So what do you do? That's what I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you. So this is what, this is the, this is the paradigm for trauma, all these kids being removed. And I think what has happened is like over the last maybe two, three years, there's really been a push toward more trauma informed ideas, right? You have to accept the fact that if over the last two, three years, we're just not talking about trauma, we have not been talking about it before that. As a primary reason for us to investigate, it has not been the model. It has not been the model in which law enforcement has engaged. It has not been the model in which uh, these, these systems have engaged. They have been more of a cognitive-based uh, model where you change your behavior, change the way you think a little bit, but it has not addressed the underlying trauma needs while they have talked about this. So we literally have no processes and I think Andre's working on it, but I don't really think we have a process yet that the system itself is a trauma-informed system. We are trying, but it's not there yet. So we got all kinds of system challenges. You know, we got housing has been a big issue for us. We, you know, I, I can't tell you the number of times I'm dealing with a single mother, three kids in the system, and we are struggling to try to find housing for her. We just lost, the, what was the name, the post reunification money? Yes. We lost, post re, we po, we lost the post reunification money, which we, we used to use in order to give the parents a place to live, to pay for rent, uh, because we would unify the kid with the parent and we'd have money so we could pay all kinds of stuff to get them, lost that funding. Placement resources, you're here in that article in the Cap Times, same thing, where are we gonna put them? They, the resources that we have now, I'll come to court and say, all right, what are we going to do with this kid? And the social workers will read off of me a list where well, this place said no, this place said no, this place said no, this place said no, this place said no. And uh oh, and I was even surprised when the Department of Corrections start telling us no. Right? So everybody talking about locking up kids. I'm telling you, the Department of Corrections will tell you no. No, they can't go to our program. No, they can't go to a 21-day evaluation. No, unless you've given them to us to have complete control over, then no, we won't accept them. And so I'm sitting in court was like, I'm not going to give the uh, Department of Corrections a control over a 14-year-old. I want to be able to say, all right, this is, not, this is not appropriate, but to give them complete control over 14 years old, y'all may have that confidence, but if you start paying attention to these cases, you wouldn't have that confidence as well. Psychiatric access, this has been a big thing for us, and I think John's team is trying his best. Man, I'm telling y'all, trying to get these kids in to see a psychiatrist is it just... It's just ridiculous. And we know these kids have all kinds of needs. We try our best when the first time they come into court, we try, I try to order a neuropsychological evaluation. I try to order these evaluations. So while they're in JRC, while they're in custody, we getting the therapist in there, evaluating them as soon as possible. So we come up with the treatment recommendations that we need before we try to send them on the streets or whatever we need. And I'm, I'm telling you, when you read these reports, it is, it is heartbreaking. You got babies who've been bipolar for years. Years. And nobody gave them medication that they need to stabilize. And once they get the medication, they're more balanced. Bipolar, you can't have a bipolar baby out there with no medication, no treatment. What they gonna do? Exactly what they have done. Transportation is always a continued issue that we struggle with, trying to get them to their services. Obviously, Madison is way more expensive, so they have lived in these other areas. Trying to get them to these, uh, to these places to get the treatment has become a cons consistent barrier for a lot of my cases. When I, took, when, I, when I came on the bench, I always talk about this, when I, and this is the reason why I say we were trauma-informed, but our practices were not. When I came on the bench, you know, John was there. When I came on, it, I don't think I was on the bench two months. And I was like, I think we need to take these handcuffs off these kids. And that sent everybody into like a crazy, like, what the hell? Uh, you ain't even been here long enough to do this. But what I realized was that I had these kids who were in JRC 
for for violating certain orders, even sometimes on chips orders. And they were being brought in for a number of reasons. And just because they were located in JRC automatically meant that when they came into court, they came with handcuffs. No matter. And we knew their histories. We knew their trauma histories. We knew what had been done to them. Some of our girls had been sex trafficked. Many of them had been abused. And it was just a straight blanket policy. Like and nobody had evaluated. And I said it made no sense. At least we can do is change the presumption so that at least the kids would have to do something in order for us to put them in handcuffs or let them be out, be, let them be free. Because the kids who could afford and had a place for them to go, guess what they came in the court? In blue jeans, they came free, talking, talking, you know, but the kids who like parents wasn't showing up or had no place to go, they ended up spending extra time in JRC for the same offenses, but they stayed there because they didn't have a place to go. There was no placement resource for them. So we changed that. And I think it's working all right. <clears throat> you know, I think it has, I think people were afraid at first, but, but, but in- We tried in 2004 before Judge Mitchell came on, the judges at the time really weren't interested. They were concerned and fearful and mm -hmm. didn't take the risk. And it's been, uh, I, I think, flawless, really. I haven't really seen any incidents at all. Yeah, I think Judge Kolos had maybe a little, little attitude, but in terms of what they thought was gonna happen, like fighting bailiffs, and kicking over chairs, and. Nope, because I firmly believe, like when people come to my courtroom, it's a way, it's a way that I do things in my courtroom to minimize the frustration. I think John's probably been in my courtroom more than anybody else, but he could tell that from the moment they walk in, it's an environment, right? Because they already traumatized. And there's been a shift, and I think Judge Mitchell takes a lot of, should take a lot of credit for shifting the philosophy just of the four judges and really trying to, to work with kids in a different way during yeah. at least that court experience. Yeah, just that moment that they hit that door. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta set that moment. And I think they really have changed that. Yes, sir. I know you're an ordained Baptist minister, and I, and I don't wanna see a lightning bolt come through here, but I think that you need to be a little bit more accurate because all I gathered was an amazing amount of pushback on what you were trying to do by every social worker that I ever spoke with about how they were upset about you were trying to utilize the judicial branch as a pulpit, and you were trying to put in a, values that heretofore have been mainstay. So I, you want to correct that a little bit? Yeah, I, I mean, I can't correct it. They, I, I, think some of, I think some of his social workers still pissed at me. You know, they still call me, they, they still, they still call me cut, cut them loose Bruce. You know, they insult me all behind my back. And you know, yeah, it's, a, it's an insult because they really do believe that, uh, you know, contrary to what other people think, that I'm out there just cutting these kids loose. And I'm like, that's not the case. The presumption of statute, as the chief said, is you return them home if their parents want them home and we can put things around them. But that is not, that was not, as I think John's point is, that was not the philosophy of the previous judges. That was not how they thought. Right? <laughs> right? It's been a, been a, a, a welcome ship. Yeah, I mean, I, I promise you it was not, it was not the philosophy. And I think, the way that the social workers were used to interacting with the judges was they make a recommendation. The judges were like, OK, so whatever that meant, that meant they go. Now, I, I just remember the first time I came in the bench, I sat down and I was listening to a case. And this girl, they wanted me to send her to jail. They wanted me to send her more time in JRC on the sanction. And I sat there, I said, well, let me see what she got to say. And the girl made logical sense. Like they wanted 30, 30 days sanction because she had disrespected a foster home. When the girl was trying to explain, like I could have cussed this woman out. She wanted me to talk. I didn't cuss her out. I just left, right? And I was like, that makes sense to me. <clears throat> I would rather you not cuss the foster home out and I understand why you had to leave. Fixed that relationship, had a conversation, didn't need to put that girl in 30 days in detention. But they were very upset because that was normally what they do. Oh, you, you know, if they let the kid talk at all, they, would, they wouldn't even, you know, got that evidence from that child. So it's just been a shift in perspective that I think many of the young people who've already been in the system, they didn't get that before the majority of us took the juvenile branch rotation. Like I just talked about listening, I don't think anybody listened to any child in any hearing that I'd ever been to. It was just all the adults just started talking. And I, because I was new, I didn't know if that was a policy. So I just kind of sat back and just kind of see how things just went. Nobody talked to the kid. Kids would just come in, put their head down. They had no, they were given no voice in the planning for how they were going to live their life, how they were going to work the next steps of their life. None of that. Uh, trauma, the adults kept stressing the kids need to address the trauma on the adults timetable. I was so surprised to hear adults telling kids you need to address this trauma right now. 
when these kids weren't in no place, no safe places, no place to live, none of that. Lincoln Hills was one that uh, I think I don't I don't quite get. I don't think people in our community quite understand how messed up Lincoln Hills really is in terms of a placement option for our children. It is as bad as everything you have seen on the news plus. Right. It is very bad. Uh, one of my kids who I just brought back home, I felt bad having them up there. But they Lincoln Hills did a couple things that that really made me very upset. They had. They would do things and they had policy. These were their policies that they had to follow that they wanted kids to go through certain kind of, they call them art therapy, art programming and program for aggression. And, and so I'm like, that would be a good thing to do. But if the kid ended up in restrictive housing, which is solitary confinement, Lincoln Hills stopped their programming, cut their programming off so that they wouldn't get any programming while they're in restrictive housing. And then when you ask them, why do you cut the programming? They would come up in court and say stuff like, uh, well, the, the kid wouldn't make himself available to us. Oh, wow. And I'd be like, uh, isn't he in restrictive housing? They were like, yes, but he wouldn't make himself available to us, so we couldn't continue any program. So you know that they will keep these kids in solitary confinement for sometimes months. Y'all realize that, right? So that means they were getting no programming, and in many cases, getting no medication as well. There, there was just a whole litany of different issues that we kept seeing and identifying in their placement of Lincoln Hills. And I think the staff were trying, but they had these adverse policies that just would not get any of our children the kind of uh, resources that they had. I, was, I got frustrated because they would, they, the kids would get injured in Lincoln Hills and they would use it as a sign of punishment so that they couldn't communicate with their parents for two weeks. So they couldn't call home to say, you know, I just got knocked out and I got abused, my head is cut, I'm bleeding, and they wouldn't let them call home, right? So by the time the mother would have gotten a call, it had been two weeks after the incident, after they'd already been to solitary confinement for maybe two weeks for the incident, and nobody was communicated, no attorney, nobody else, right? Joe? Yeah. 20 minutes also. All right. I almost think I know the young man, he had, he had to go to Lincoln Hills. Yeah. And so I'm very concerned that when we do bring him back to Lincoln Hills, even though maybe it's not going to great at Lincoln Hills, I just really struggle with putting him back and put him in the same high school environment that um, doesn't, is, we're not really dealing with him. Yeah, well, first of all, he wasn't, it wasn't a surprise. Like, I've been bringing him back for the last months after months, and the department knew I was bringing him back. They just didn't think that, they just didn't assume that I was going to bring him back. But he served his time, right? Juveniles, juveniles, it's funny that juveniles get a blank check, right? When we send us an adult, we say, I'm going to give you six months, and then you're going to get time after that. Or a year, and you're going to get time. Juveniles are the only ones you come in here, and they be like, well, we got you. We got you six months, but we're going to get an extension. We got another six months, we're going to get an extension. And so I believe that if a child goes and they serve that year, I mean, I extended them once. So I'm like, there's no way that we can extend them. If they haven't got, if they haven't resolved it by this time, then at least we need to try something else. And the department knew he was coming back. They knew that the whole head of time. So I told them a month before that hearing came in, when we did the extension, that that's a possibility. We may come in, get the social workers in there. Social workers were in the hearing. Like they, so they knew it was coming back. So if they came, if they came in like it was a surprise, it was not a surprise. It was not. But part of that, we don't have jurisdiction on that kid until they, until they come back. But, the, but it's di that's different than saying that they didn't know that I was, I had already told them the right. forecast we he was coming back. We wouldn't be able to communicate with the school at, at that point around that because we don't have jurisdiction on that case. And nobody would have had jurisdiction because he, he had terminated. Right. I mean, so normally I would expect the Department of Corrections to communicate with the school district that this kid's going to be transitioning back in 60, 90 right. days or whatever. Yes. I mean, so I think there are some things that we can do better as systems mm -hmm. right. to communicate better. And, 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 and Everett, I want to give you credit because of all the judges, you write some of the most creative sanctions. Um, and I read them in depth and I highlight them for school staff because you will list specific kids that this kid does not have contact with. But what I try to impress upon the schools when I send those adjudication notices and documents to them is that we have to build safety, safety plans yep. for that kid and all those other kids to ensure that these kids aren't having contact with each other so we're compliant with the judge's order. Yep. And um, it's a challenge. And uh, I can't, and this is one of the big struggles about this whole system, you guys, is that the, the information sharing and the timing of all this, it just, and, and 
then you, you got a kid and pull myriads. But, but let me say this, Joe. It is better now than it was before. Because when, when I came on, I could tell you this much. There was no system in place. I mean, I remember talking to Ricardo and meeting Ricardo for the first. And I, I remember talking to Jen right after I took the bill. I said, how is it that my kids can't, don't know who to talk to, the family don't know who to talk to, know who, how to get in? It was, it was just chaos, right? I would bring in kids from different places. And we ain't talking about Lincoln Hill. We talking about just bringing them in for a residential care center where we put them up there for treatment. Now we need to bring them back so they can go to school and nobody knew what to do with them. Right. And that's why that's how we started the Office of Youth Engagement. That's why we started the conversation with Paris to get that started, because there was no connection whatsoever to any of these systems. Now, the other part that that, that I thought was uh, was most devastating to me, probably as as an African-American man who believes in education, was how we were doing these short school days. I'm telling you that, that if there's any mark on this community that is that is stained out, that should stain us and we should be ashamed of, is that for over 20 years we were putting black, brown, low-income white children in shortened school days for over 20 years and nobody said anything about it. It is it, just a shame. So when people come ask me, you know, they write me letters to the court, they would be like, well, what are you doing to address this? I said, you should ask yourself the question why they were even able to even be outside stealing cars. Because they were legitimately keeping these kids out of school. Now, my, now uh, as much as we had worked on this to try to streamline this, every school, every high school, every middle school had their own discretion to put these kids in short school days. And when I've, tried, when I've had to subpoena people in from these high schools to give me, they start writing me letters saying, no, we will not let this person back in this school. When it was against federal law to do so. This is, if they did this for 20 years, that means that you have, what, it, what, it, what was that, those, those trends, right? For over 20 years, this has been the process by which the, all these young people from middle school on up to high school have not been given any access to the same education as their peers at the same time. And, and it wasn't until, we, until I threatened to you know, file a, you know, a complaint that you know, we, got, we all came to the table, everybody came to the courtroom, right? We sit down and they were like, okay, yeah, yeah, this is, this is, yeah, we didn't do this right. And now it's only two people that can make those decisions versus having a multitude of people having the discretion to do so. Man, I was an embarrassment. And it's not just mass. I got kids in some prairie, in Verona, in Middleton, in Wanakee, where they make these decisions and keep these kids out of school and they blame it on their uh, behavioral referral status, which again is against the federal law for them to be doing so for just behavior by itself when there's no medical reason to do so. Um, just mental, again, I'm, I'm lost. You said something about two hours in school, I, IDP, two hours in school. So, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I should slow it down. So, so could you just yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. What do you mean? So, so IEPs are individualized education plans, which what we traditionally have called special education. Yeah. All right. We all these kids and we know that the black and brown kids have IEPs. I was saying John could correct me if I'm wrong. or Andre, I would say almost 85, 90 percent of kids who come through formal adjudication process. They have IEPs, mm -hmm. right? So they have these special education needs that they have these IEPs put in place to assist them. One of the federal rules about IEPs is that if they have these IEPs, they're not supposed to be put on short school days for behavioral referrals. Okay. Not, despite that, over the last 20 years, we have seen, at least from the data that they gather from the school district for over 20 years, Black, brown, and low-income white children have been systemically placed in shortened school days for behavioral reasons. Because they believe that they, their behavior... It, they, they put them out for their behavior because they can't behave themselves in the traditional setting of school. So they then put them into one and a half, two hours a day. It may be in the school building. It may not be in the school building. It may be at a community center, not. Uh, in some, I think I got some kids at libraries. So they're not in the school. They move them outside the school, hour and a half, two hours a day. And, it, and this had been the policy uh, that had existed and that's why I keep saying it, for over 20 years. That's, that's a long time. And, then, and, this and it's against the law. Just to calibrate, bro, this is not just high school. This no. happens in junior high. Yes, middle. Oh, I understand. And, 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 and we'll reinforce, this is not just medicine. Yes. 
Nope. As a matter of fact, the ones that we deal with are not in mass. And, and in some cases, the school does not know where the child is. How much time I got? They are not in their school. How much time I got, Renee? Uh, Seven. Thirteen. All right. So, so let me let me let me keep down this line. So when people so when people are trying to assess, like, what do you do with a kid? I'm looking at all pieces of these kids' lives, not as well as the offense, as well as the victims, and trying to explain. How, how do we get, how, how, do, how do we get here? Because I'm telling you, they're illiterate. They, they, they're struggling with reading and writing. They're smart kids because they can talk. They got, I mean, John can tell you, they got enough attitude to say whatever, I mean. But when you actually put something in front of them, that's when it makes all of us just, it just breaks our heart. It, it, it just, so I use this book a lot, The Body Keeps the Score. It is helping me understand and reframe trauma. Uh, so that the decisions, like you know, like you say, the stuff I write or the the way I talk, the way we behave in our court system, it's really guided by this process. So I don't make their post-traumatic stress moments even worse. Uh, you know, we know a lot about uh, you know intersections of trauma. We know about emotional flooding. This is what I. This is how I see our kids stay. They're in a constant state of emotional floodedness. They they stay there. So that means that they're always ready. Right. They always at the moment. Right. It's just almost like you be like, you know, chicken. And then they just pop. I want chicken. I want fish. And, and, and you're in an argument. Over, what are you arguing about? Because they always in a state of flooded spaces. So however you engage them, it's very important that you're doing something to reduce the flooding rather than escalating the flooding. And my bailiff does a wonderful job of that. He is a, he's excellent. He, I don't know if because he, I don't know if it's because he's short or what it is, but he, I mean, he, he connects with him right there. And I mean, he's able to do it in such a way that they, he brings them down every time. Uh, I, they, they don't have a map of the world. That's the biggest heart the thing for people, especially majority white people who, and black, even black folks now who have not been through trauma. They don't understand that these kids don't have a map. Right. When you have been trauma or abused by the people that you trust, you don't have a map. So I'm in a barbershop arguing with my own my own people like they like these kids are bad. We need to lock these kids up. I said, first of all, why do you call them bad? I said, because order for them to be bad, somebody got to have taught them how to be good. You assume somebody taught them how to do that. We got, I got one kid, I swear, I promise you. Well, from like 11 years old, I think his the mama's boyfriend taught him how to steal. And he stole from every business in this city such that when I told him where he couldn't go, I was like, where can he go? <laughs> you need to move outside the city in order to even have a life because the boyfriend taught him at 12, 11, 12, 13 years old how to rob stores. That's what he was doing at 12, 13 years. Old. They ain't got no map. Ain't nobody. They raising themselves. When you think about 12, 13, 14 year old, the moment that you arrest them in a stolen car, you got to ask yourself, well, how in the world are you out here at two o'clock in the morning and don't nobody know where you are? And they don't care that they know, don't know who you are. They're all the same. They're all the same. I went, I went to go spend, spend some time with these kids for Thanksgiving because that's what I do. I spent thanks. John, tell you, I'm in there Thanksgiving. I'm in there Christmas. I'm there on Thursdays just hanging out with these kids. They'll tell you the same thing. I'm like, where's your mama? Mm. Where's your daddy? Mm. Who you stand with? Maybe my grandma, but she put me out there once in a while. They are literally raising themselves out here in these streets. <laughs> so I do a lot of stuff, man. I, I do a lot of stuff. I bring a lot of kids into the courtroom. Man, listen, I brought in a preschool cat class. I got pre-K kids coming in my name. I'm like, all right, that's what we're going to do with justice, you know, because I want them to experience, you know, court system and justice a little bit differently. You know, even, you know, when I do my adoptions, I'm adopting babies. I'm trying to give them a different vision of what, what it could be because they're going to find their families, bringing in youth from, you know, other cities, bringing our kids from some prairie. So we can, we, we, can, we can do something to capture their imagination so they don't end up in the system and they don't end up doing more harm to themselves. Themselves. So these are just things that we're proactively doing all the time. Uh, you know, providing, com providing opportunities for community leaders to come do ride-alongs. I invite people all the time to come in, working with the, uh, right now we're finishing up our, uh, our policy with the Department of Public Instruction to make sure we got the shortened school days revamped. Obviously, the Office of Youth Engagement was important for me to, you know, testify to get that started so Paris and his team can start working with these kids. We give out gift cards. Um, I thank Andre for that. I'm giving out gift cards like they butter. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? Anytime these kids come in, because let me tell y'all something. 
Sometimes these kids ain't eight. The most heartbreaking, sir, most heartbreaking thing I had was one kid, she was trying her best to stay off these streets. And she coming to the courtroom, I'm looking at her, she's just looking all disheveled. I'm like, baby, when was the last time you ate? She hadn't. I said, are you serious? And this will prompt me to push for these gift cards. I said, you haven't eaten? So I had my staff go to my refrigerator. I said, go get this baby my food. And I promise y'all, she sat in court and ate like she hadn't eaten in the last three days. Because she hadn't. She hadn't. We do more frequent, I do a lot of reviews to ensure children are receiving the adequate mental health services, connecting black and brown youth with relevant services because uh, as Andre knows, another issue is how do we get people into the courtroom to help these people out? Right? I need mentors. I need real-time mentors. Not this, like, you know, I talk to some groups and they be like, well, give us another year and maybe we get around to, I'm like, get, what the hell? No, I need, now. I got a kid that ain't got nobody right now. I need somebody now. Well, you know, we're not set up to do that right now. We got a waiting list right now. So sometimes people get frustrated because I'm like, I can't wait for them. I got to go grab me people who can do it right now today. When I pick up the phone and say, I need you to hold them, they'll be right there in court to make sure it works. Because we need those mentors. Let, let me hurry up. I integrate oral sentencing because it makes no sense to have kids who can't read try to read. So I tell them, go watch 13th and then come back and tell me what it's all about. Or go, go do these kind of things that they can see. And then I, we try to support kids who are parenting themselves. I do a lot of presenting as social workers. John has been kind. We did some book drives. We spent Thanksgiving, opened up the doors. I even brought the UW Law School, Black Law School Association, so they could start once a month coming in and meeting the kids. And then this is what I think is the most important thing I do. I apologize. I apologize to the kids. And I tell them I am sorry. Because the majority of these kids have never had no adult ever admit that the way that they have been treated is a disrespectful way they've been treated. And I apologize to them. Even if I'm going to send them to Lincoln Hills, I don't tell them that you're the most horrible person ever. I spend time explaining to them, this is what Judge Mitchell asked you to do. Then I asked you to do that. Yes, sir. Then I asked you to be like this. Yes, sir. Then I asked you to do that. Yes, you did, Your Honor. You chose to make a different decision. Yes, I did. You understand why I'm doing this. Yes, I do. All right. Doesn't mean I don't believe in you because I do. But there are consequences for these actions. And you've, you have left me without the evidence I need to make a different choice right now. But we still believe in you. You understand that. Yes, Your Honor, I do. Because they need people to say I'm sorry. Because they have been let down by every adult who said they loved them or cared for them. And they've done them the exact opposite of what they promised them to do. And so you have to say, I'm sorry. So even when I'm making, you know, choices about who I'm going to lock up or how am I going to keep them, how long I'm going to keep them in custody, I tell the kids, you got to give me evidence. I can't be out here just letting you out in the streets. That's why I think it's, it was crazy when I saw these articles online talking about Judge Mitchell just releasing kids out here in the streets. I'm like, these people are doing nothing but race baiting in here because that ain't even true. I have kids in custody, and John will tell you, I keep them in there because I'll tell them. You don't give me the evidence I need. I'm not going to let you out. You at least need to be leveling up at JRC. They need to at least come into court and say, you know what, Judge? They did, he did exactly what you asked him to do. She did exactly what you asked him to do before they even get a chance to get out and begin to get back into this community because it's most important that they understand how to take responsibility than it is for them to just be released because they think that they have been done wrong. Yes, ma'am. Um, Judge Mitchell, there's a thing going around that these um, young men that are still in cars yes. that um, the judicial system, you, you and other judges, are allowing them to be released mm -hmm. back home or wherever they came from. Yeah. So they are repeat offenders. Yes. In words. I, listen, Miss. So what's the facts around that? Because Miss Sanders, listen. Too much black mothers have been talking about what can we do. This this is my list. Okay. Of all of the kids who have repeat offenses in our community, right here, we got the list. All the judges, we pull our list of all the kids that we have repeat offenders. Uh, we have, it's, it's 27 youth responsible for 133 cases since January 2008. And this is just OMWOX. It's not all of them, this is just the OMWOX. 
When I look through this list, there are two things you got to understand. One, some of these kids have gyps. You know what, gyps is different than chips. Gyps means a juvenile in need of protection services. That means that they have come to court, they have been evaluated, and they have been found not competent. When they are found not competent, I might be able to hold them in JRC if they have a new referral for a little bit, but I cannot hold them in custody. And some of my kids who are on this list, they have gyps, which means that hey, there is, unless there's a placement that will take them, RCC, group home, then you cannot hold them in secure custody like that. Or corrections. Or corrections. So that means that it can't, you know, people say, why don't you send them Lincoln Hill? <coughs> there's no statutory authority for me to hold them in Lincoln Hills when they have been found not competent because if they are found not competent to proceed, that means there's actually no case for which the jurisdiction to place them on <coughs> so they can be sent there, right? And so we have a lot of kids like that that need that kind of additional support because they're not found competent. Competent, what would cause them Yeah, what does that mean? So that means that they're, no, they're not able to assist their their lawyer in their own defense, that they don't understand processes, that they're struggling with processes, understanding the broad concepts of that. And so the, so the psychiatrist will deem that they're not competent and we have two, they're either not likely to regain competence or they can be educated back to competence. If they can be educated, John will take them, talk about the process, try to educate them. But if it's, they're not likely to regain competence, that means that the chick case goes into gyps and then we try to put services around them uh, to support them as they try to go on. So what's breaking my heart about this is, and, and, and I feel a little bad that I'm, I'm just now seeing the full picture, that you have these kids and you say, well, let's get them help or let's send them, there's nowhere for them to go. Yes. And I, I guess that's what the reality is, you know, of course we think, well, where's their mother? Where's their father? Right. Where's their grandmother? Right. Where's right. their church? Where's right. their neighbor next door? Those of us who grew up in extended family, there's nowhere for these kids to go <coughs> but on the street or around people that are, are, are you know, older people that are in, enabling them uh, to do this. And it, 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 you know, and I know, uh, just how frustrating it can be for for me. I can just imagine for those of you that are dealing with it, you know, with those 27 or the 127 or the 227 or the one. Um, and we've got to find a way. We've got to find a solution uh, because it, it's almost like you're fighting a forest fire with water holes and a strong wind is coming tomorrow. The new the book I'm starting to read now that I read, and I think all of us who are really, if you're really serious about this is you need to read the book Disintegration. Disintegration. Disintegration by Eugene Robinson. He wrote it in 2007. But it was something in there that Eugene Robinson said that I thought was very, kept. It, it captured exactly what we're facing right now. It just took a while for it to get to Madison. It has existed everywhere else, right? And he said it's four different black Americas. We think it's like, you got like one black community. Ain't no one black community. We don't just go hang out at black parties all together. No, it's four different. He said it's the elite. He said it's the middle class, he said it's the abandoned, and he said it's the newly emergent. He said what you're experiencing is an abandoned community that no longer have bridges to the middle class anymore, right? And it's different than African immigrants or biracial families. When we're talking about abandoned, we're talking about folks who have literally been cut off in islands away from any kind of bridge to be able to assist them. So education, <coughs> mental health, social health. Adequate help, any kind of any kind of thing we need, and we know that that exists right here in Dane County, right? It is just taking a while for us to catch up.